Welcome to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and I'm joined by my two colleagues, Deputy Directors Helen Miller and Carl Emerson. And it's this time of the year we at the IFS get a bit excited because we've got a budget coming up next Wednesday, the 3rd of March. It'll be Rishi Sunak's second budget, though he's managed about 13 major fiscal announcements over the last year as he's responded to the COVID crisis and its consequences. So uh, perhaps, Carl, we could start just by asking the question, why, why do we at the IFS always get so excited about budgets? What, what, what are they all about and why, why, why might this one be particularly interesting? Well, twice a year, the Chancellor presents to the country, firstly, his latest or the government's latest forecast for the economy, for the public finances. And alongside that, he unveils a package of measures, um, tax measures, spending measures, sometimes some other policies too, um, which are really important. Uh, Tax revenues make up about 40% of what the economy produces in a year. Um, So clearly, if you do them badly, you can do a lot of damage. And if you do them less badly, you'll do less damage. You've got a lot of spending power there. You can make people's lives um, much better. So we hear a lot about what the Chancellor wants to do to the tax system, to public spending. That really matters for people's lives. It'll affect the incomes they have. It'll affect the prices they face in the shops. It'll affect um, their employers um, in many ways. And that's probably even more so the case at the moment with Many households, many employers really struggling at the moment with the pandemic and the lockdown that's had to be implemented in response to that pandemic. Of course, the other thing that we, we get each um, each budget, uh, which is particularly interesting for us at the IFS, are the set of numbers from the Office for Budget Responsibility, uh, which has been going now for uh, somewhat more than 10 years. And at each uh, big fiscal event, it lays out its forecasts for the economy, uh, and a whole load of detail on the public finance uh, numbers. So, Carl, for people listening uh, next week, what, what numbers from the OBR might, uh, might we be looking out for? Well, I suspect a lot of the headlines might be about the amount of borrowing the government has done in the current year, um, which is partly a consequence of much reduced economic activity, meaning less tax receipts, meaning more spending but actually is largely a result of Mr Sunak's announcements through the last year, the 13 announcements you mentioned, where there's been huge giveaways to try and support public services, households and employers through these very difficult times. So that deficit this year, um, maybe £400 billion, maybe a bit less, um, but it's going to be huge. It's going to be a, a, a record um, outside the two world wars of the 20th century. But that we can be certain about. I think what's more important is... What are the prospects for the economy and with it government revenues and with that the deficit over the subsequent few years? And in particular, in, say, year five of the forecast, to what extent does the OBR think that the economy might still be producing less than what it would have done? And therefore, to what extent will the tax system be generating less in the way um, of revenue? And not just the central forecast that the OBR produces, because there's so much uncertainty, you know, to what extent do we think we can be um, confident that the, the deficit at that point will, will lie between certain ranges? What's perhaps an optimistic scenario for the economy, which we must all hope will materialise? And perhaps what does a more pessimistic outlook look for, which unfortunately we may wish to prepare ourselves for? And why that matters is because while the government can borrow huge sums of money this year at very, very low cost, it can't keep doing that year on year on year on year. And if the economy doesn't recover fully, and in particular, if we want to to, to to spend more as a result of the pandemic we've been through, then we're going to need more in the way of tax revenues. And at some point, that will point to tax rises, which will affect um, real people, if you like, in forms of how much income they have. And again, how much the prices of things they face in the shops are. And as you say, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. I don't envy the job of the OBR and their new chairman, uh, Richard Hughes, who has to make these uh, prognostications about the future when we know very little about uh, what's going to happen to the path of the virus and indeed the path of recovery, because we've never had an episode like the episode we've had over the last year. So there's not much to go on in terms of historic data. 
uh, and the uncertainty about whether the economy will pretty much get back to its previous path or really be knocked off course for the long run is very big indeed. And that then makes the job of the Chancellor very difficult as well, because he has to make his policy choices in that uncertainty. Um, But Helen is also facing uncertainty, isn't he, over the short run. Whilst we've had the uh, Prime Minister announcing the planned uh, movement out of lockdown over the next few months, that's only a plan. And as he keeps telling us, it depends on the data. Uh, And in that circumstance, the Chancellor is going to have to make some pretty big choices about when the furlough scheme, the Corona Job Retention Scheme, uh, continues until, how he's going to continue to support the self-employed, how he's going to continue to support businesses. I mean, how how is he going to make those kinds of trade-offs? He's clearly not going to just shut them all down overnight, but he can't keep them going forever. No, so you're right. The transition is going to be the key bit here. I mean, there's a, there's a consensus that all the time the economy is you know, shut the way it is now, it makes sense for the Chancellor to be effectively paying the wages of people who can't work and, you know, giving things like business rates, holidays to businesses that can't be open. Everyone also agrees that once the economy is fully open again, you absolutely don't want those policies in place. And if we knew when the economy was open, it would be very easy, but we don't. And there's going to be this grey area where the economy is starting to open, more shops are open, more people are going out but maybe not all shops are open and maybe people aren't going out as much as they used to, or there's still come some kind of social distancing is still restricting how much businesses can really operate. Um, and it's to be that weird grey area that the Chancellor's going to have to navigate. So broadly, his choices are, um, you know, he has the furlough scheme, which is you know, the scheme through which he's basically paying the wages of people who can't work. He can just decide to cut it at some point. I think that brings it with it risk, because as you said, Boris Johnson's very, very clear that this is all about data and not dates. So if he picks the wrong date, um, there's a chance that he would be withdrawing support far too quickly. Um, the alternative is to phase out the schemes in some way. So to say that they'll still provide some support, but some support at a lower level, for example. So you can imagine saying you know, the support seem, system will be in place fully, you know, for example, in May, but maybe in June, July, part of August would be in place, but at a much lower level, um, possibly contingent on some of these reopenings that are in the roadmap, such that by the time we actually got out of the crisis, out of, you know, out of the lockdown, then the measures would be out, you know, would be gone. But you'd have some phased reopening. But that is going to be a difficult balancing act um, to trade off. Basically, you don't want to withdraw support too quickly and have the economy, you know, to crash. Most under all that good work, we've preserved all these jobs so far. Let's not undo that. But nor do you want to keep this going so long that the schemes themselves end up inhibiting the recovery and stopping people getting back to work and, and reopening fully. And I think that last point is really important because there will be a lot of pressure to keep these things going as long as possible. But the longer you keep them going, the more, the longer we're going to be supporting businesses that really aren't viable and that will go to the wall in the end and keeping people in jobs that don't really exist and therefore stopping them going, looking for other jobs and essentially preventing the economy from... Uh, moving back to normal or whatever the new normal um, happens to be. But there are quite difficult judgments even within that because there may well be sectors which are still subject to significant um, uh, significant restrictions. You might think that airlines aren't going to be travelling as much as they were or that nightclubs aren't going to be open to their full extent. And we don't know quite how long that's going to go on. So he's got this tricky decision about the economy as a whole, but he's also got some tricky decisions about whether he's going to provide support for particular bits of the economy, doesn't he? He does. But he should also remember that, um, as difficult as all that is, he also has lots of policies at his disposal. So we're focusing currently on you know the furlough schemes and the schemes that have been put in place during the crisis, which are remarkable. They were put up very quickly and it's remarkable that the government is paying the, the wages of so many people. So, you know, these, these really are unusual schemes. Um, and okay, it does make sense to phase them out in some way. But of course, there are other things, other problems that might arise. Like you just mentioned, one example is that most of the economy is reopened, but maybe foreign travel is still restricted and airlines and airports and related businesses are struggling. If that is the situation, then rather than just try to think about, you know, how to have extend this general support measure to everybody through the coronavirus job retention scheme, you could instead have something much more targeted just to that industry, possibly through grants or through tax cuts, targeted more specifically at that. Similarly, if we think that once reopening happens, um, 
there are some sectors with you know demand short of 40 plant going back to restaurants as quickly as they might otherwise do then there are other policy levers the government can pull um to stimulate some of that spending so although he has a difficult task um he, ha- he has lots of policies at his disposal and you know we've talked about just extending the current policies he can think of other policies maybe later in summer or in autumn if things you know don't materialize in quite you know in quite the way we might hope and it's it's worth remembering, isn't it, that um, last summer when he and you know, many of us hoped that the virus wouldn't come back with quite such a, a vengeance, um, he was looking also at uh, measures at that point to stimulate the economy. So he's got choices not just about things like the the furlough scheme and the business rates holidays, but some of the uh, some of the schemes which were designed really to get the economy going again uh the stamp duty holiday on purchase on 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 properties below half a million pounds is one example so how's he going to make that kind of um decision are you expecting for example helen that that stamp duty holiday will continue so i think there's a difficult balance here to have so my expectation is no um but you know thinking what the thinking about the you know the problem he faces it's basically you know at the moment both supply and demand are being very heavily constrained by the lockdown measures. So businesses can't operate more because they're shut and people can't go out because they're, they're told to stay at home. So at the moment, you know, it's difficult to stimulate the economy just because the economy is shut. Uh, it's also difficult to know as, you know, once these lockdown, we move through this roadmap and the lockdown measures come down, it's going to be hard to know in advance how quickly the economy will come back. So if, for example, as the lockdown measures come, come down, you know, businesses open really quickly, everyone goes back out and rushes out to restaurants and pubs and attractions then it's not clear to me that there is going to be much room for a fiscal stimulus because the economy will be operating as as hot as it can. Um, if, however, what happens is we have own, reopening, but actually demand is still kind of sluggish relative to the new capacity and people aren't really going out quickly, then maybe there'll be some room for some of these sort of very well-targeted, very well-timed stimuluses. But I think it is a little bit difficult um, to judge exactly what shape that should take in advance. I think I should stand ready to act, maybe tell people they're ready to act, but I wouldn't think of them as it being the big flagship of the budget. Um, just on stamp duty itself, that's a little bit different because obviously people can buy houses now in lockdown. It's one of the activities you can do and you can you know, go and buy paint and wallpaper and furniture and you know, furnish your new houses. So if he was going to do any kind of stimulus now, I think it's, it's better to do that one than, say, a, you know, a VAT cut, which wouldn't make sense right now. Um, but again, the, the balancing act he's trying to make is you don't want to just spend money for the sake of it because we've got a big deficit already. You want to spend money, money well at targeted at solving problems and personally, I would wait in to see if some of those problems materialise and exactly how they materialise before I moved on a fiscal stimulus. But but there is a judgment call there. Yeah, that's interesting because there's clearly uh, a lot of pressure for a big opening of the or further opening of the um, of, of the chancellor's wallet. People are talking a lot about uh, Joe Biden's plan uh, in the United States, which seems to involve very large amounts of additional. Spending and uh, there's certainly some in some suggestions that uh, British governments and possibly European ones are being too conservative with a small c uh, about the degree of fiscal stimulus, in other words, tax cuts and spending increases that they're contemplating. Carl, what what, what what's your view about uh, you know the extent to which we should be expecting you know a lot of fiscal support, a lot of tax cuts and spending increases to get the economy back through to the other side? Or, or to what extent do you think now is the time to row back or, or as Helen was suggesting, wait and see? So if you look at the cross-country data that the IMF produced, they've got estimates of how big the package is that each country is implemented in response to the coronavirus. And actually, the UK's package on their measures is pretty big. Um, New Zealand has a much bigger one. The United States is slightly bigger as of now. But most other advanced economies, if anything, have done smaller packages. But I think actually that only takes you so far. You really want to know about the details of what's in those packages, how they compare in terms of their mix. And also, you've got to remember a lot of this is about what system you had in place before the virus. If you had a social security safety net, for example, which gave people Um, support that was more related to their previous earnings, perhaps you wouldn't have needed to do £20 a week on universal credit, for example. Um, So in some sense, perhaps the US and the UK have got bigger packages because their safety net was more likely to be deemed to be a bit too um, weak for the current climate. Um, 
if Biden does do something like a $2 trillion injection, that's clearly very, very big and clearly much bigger than um, other economies, including the UK, um, have done. In terms of what the Chancellor should actually do, I certainly wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be looking to tighten at the moment. Um, I'd be looking to extend the measures he has in place. I would be looking to phase them out gradually in the way that Helen suggested. So perhaps focusing on uh, the phasing out linked explicitly to the four stages of the Prime Minister's plan rather than explicit dates. Um, Given the government can borrow so cheaply, public sector investment, if you can do it well, always looks like a good thing to do. If there are other targeted and temporary tax measures that you can do that give you good bang for the buck, and maybe the stamp duty one is an example of that, then again, it's a good thing to do. Um, and actually, the Chancellor should draw one lesson from last year is that he can't stand up next week and say, this is what I'm going to do, and then come back in the autumn and give us an update. He's going to almost certainly have to return with new measures as we get more information. So staying nimble, being prepared to do more if things start opening up, but people don't return, as Helen was saying, then you definitely need to think about measures at that point. And you certainly don't want to be pre-announcing the introduction of, for example, VAT cuts. Um, You need need to make sure you've got things ready to go if they are needed and you need to stay nimble. So oddly enough, we might have uh, another budget, but actually some of the big announcements may wait for uh, another sort of interim fiscal announcement in June or July, when we know more about what's happening, um, and that's uh, it'd be interesting to see whether whether the Chancellor is explicit about that, or whether he actually tries to do uh, as much as he can uh, in this budget. I think it comes back to what we were saying at the start about you have two fiscal events a year, in fact, one budget normally a year. And is that the right frequency? Well, in normal situations where the economy is just ticking along, arguably they're too frequent. But in situations like the moment where there's new news arriving, where things are changing so quickly, they're probably not frequent enough. And the Chancellor is right to make new announcements when he gets radically different information. So, Carl, you, you, you've talked quite a lot about the um, the public finances and the fact that we you know, borrowed more in the last year than in any year in history outside of the world wars. And you've raised the, the worries about that, the high borrowing continuing. I mean, to what extent is that a worry? And to what extent is that something the Chancellor should be taking into account? Because you've also said that borrowing costs are at historic lows. And we know that debt interest at the moment is it is lowest ever, essentially. The amount we're actually spending on debt interest is lower as a fraction of national income or revenues than it has ever been. I mean, in those circumstances, um, isn't this the ideal opportunity to, uh, you know, just spend, spend, spend? It absolutely is if two conditions are met. One, that you spend the money well. Um, Spending on completely wasteful things um, is not good, even if you can borrow incredibly cheaply. Um, And secondly, as long as you can continue to borrow as cheaply as you currently can. So what that points to is making sure that the spending or the tax cuts are very well targeted, very efficiently done. And also making sure you can do whatever you can to reassure people that you're going to take the stewardship of the economy over the medium and longer term very, very seriously, which involves policy settings in a whole number of areas from the setting of interest rates, Bank of England independence, to the way in which fiscal policy is conducted, the role of the OBR and all our other institutions. So doing as much as you can to reinforce confidence that the UK takes these things very, very seriously will give you the ability to borrow cheaply for longer. Uh, The other thing you can do, as we've said before in these podcasts, is try and lock in more of your borrowing costs for a longer time horizon. So you're less exposed to that risk that suddenly international investors who are choosing to lend the UK government money suddenly decide they want a bigger return than they're currently getting. So if you can lock those rates in for longer, then again, as long as you can spend that money well, you'll, you'll do well. You've, um, I mean, you, you've laid out two conditions for doing it well. One is that we can continue to borrow very cheaply, and the other is that we spend the money well. I mean, is, is there not a third one, which is that we presumably want to make sure that we're not, in the economics jargon, crowding out private sector activity, so that um, you know you could have the government just taking over more of the economy uh, where it's getting in the way of. Um, what might be happening in the private sector. And um, are we we potentially at that point or have we got lots of space um, for more government activity because the private sector is not 
doing so much at the moment. I mean, I think I'd count that as part of the spending. Well, if you're if you're just spending, if you're doing public spending that would have occurred anyway, if you're crowding out worthwhile private investment, then that's not good spending. Um, whether we'd be doing crowding out at the moment, of course, partly comes back to Helen's question about as we reopen the economy. Is it the case there's lots of spare capacity there? If we've got lots of people who are unemployed, if we've got lots of businesses who've got spare capacity and it's not being taken up, then this is a very good time to do it. Um, If we've got great public sector investments to get working on, then you can employ people at the moment to do them. And perhaps they wouldn't have um, as good private sector jobs if you weren't doing that. So it could be a good moment to do it. Even if we're doing all that, of course, that costs money. Um, and I think as we've uh, as we've discussed, um, borrowing levels of borrowing are likely to remain likely, but not certain to remain elevated for a period, and that may mean that uh, debt is continuing to rise. We know that even ignoring the uh, impact of the of the virus, we've got some real challenges coming down the road as health spending rises, pension spending rises, as the population ages, and that's going to mean the um, state's going to get bigger, probably. Um, So there's been quite a lot of discussion about tax increases. And um, I mean, oddly enough, there was quite a lot of discussion about this last summer, which always struck me as being very uh, far too early to be talking about it. But Helen, do you think we might get any tax increases or hints of tax increases in this upcoming budget? So my guess is that we won't get really big tax increases. I think the consensus among economists is that now is not the time for doing a big fiscal tightening because the economy is still, you know, we haven't even started recovery properly yet. So we don't want to be trying to dampen that down. So um, big tax increases, no. I mean, I think if the Chancellor wants to do some permanent giveaways, so maybe, for example, around universal credit, he might have his eye on that long-term deficit and think about, you know, trying to trying to pay for them now. So maybe we'll see some smaller tax increases around the edges to, to sort of pay for things in the budget. But um, but I don't think it will be a big tax rise in budget. I think what the government should and hopefully will do is start to do some of the thinking and planning and sort of setting out the vision for some of those longer run tax rises. Because you know, even once we get to the point where we can start raising taxes without doing too much damage, I think it would be a real mistake to just be trying to tweak rates or put up rates. Um, I think we should be thinking much more boldly about actually reforming taxes you know what does that mean it means you know well designed well you know well designed taxes basically raise revenue with less economic damage and less damage on you know how much output we produce and how well off we are and of course that always matters but at a time when you're trying to recover from one of these historic crises it particularly matters that you have taxes that are as well designed as possible and if you look at any of our taxes as we all know they're each all of them could be reformed in a way that would make them better so just give you one concrete example there's been some you know murmurings that maybe the chancellor will nudge up corporation tax or capital gains tax rates in this budget um as a relatively small move if they did that in isolation it would worsen investment incentives so there are definite trade-offs there but you could mitigate if not remove completely some of those effects by changing the tax base the definition of what is taxed so if you thought of a bigger reform package that you know basically improved investment incentives that would help aid the recovery and get the private sector investing more while changing tax rates um, to help public finance the medium run, and that's a much more attractive package. So I think regardless of what they do on rates or you know taxes in this budget, what I hope we'll see is some vision of, that says that acknowledges we need to reform taxes and sets out um, some sort of sense of direction and travel and process that says we're going to have these consultations, we're going to think about these issues, so that in three or four years' time, we're not just trying to quickly raise revenue, we've got a well-set-out plan for how we raise revenues in the best possible way. Well, well, let's maybe come on to some of the specifics of um, tax reform in a, in a moment. But, but um, there's been quite a lot of speculation, as you as you hinted at, about a possible rise in the rate of corporation tax in this budget. I've no idea whether there's any um, you know, any accuracy in in that speculation. But um, supposing he were to raise the rate, not not change anything else in the way that you're suggesting. Given that our rates of corporation tax are much lower than they were just a few years ago, and indeed lower than most other advanced countries, why why would you actually be worried about raising corporation tax? Or perhaps perhaps you wouldn't be terribly worried about a couple of pence on the main rate? So if you're going to raise taxes at all, then I think at this point in time, given where we are, corporation tax would be one of the less bad ones to raise, because very broadly, you know, it's based on profits and those firms that are making profits at the moment are the ones that have done relatively well in the crisis. So 
um, you know, I'd, I'd worry a little bit less about that. And it, you know, we wouldn't be impacting firms that have done really badly, wouldn't be paying higher tax rates at the moment. So that, you know, that speaks towards that being a better tax rise than some other options you might um pick and as you said the rate is relatively low by uh, international standards so a couple of percentage points um, I don't think would worry us too much but it is still worth remembering that you know it's easy to compare rates across country but those all those tax base issues do matter too so definition of what is tax how many how much interest sorry, how much investment spending you can deduct from your profits before you get taxed on them um, really matters quite a lot and on that measure the UK is a lot less generous than other countries so our tax base is less competitive than other countries so I think we should at least keep an eye on that tax base. Again, ideally just reform the tax base and make it uh, make it a better tax base, but not get carried away and think we can always just raise rates um, without it having um, any effect. There's some other things worth, you know, kind of half bearing in mind that we have to think about the main rate of corporation tax. We always have a surcharge on banks at the moment, which is an extra eight percentage points. Um, so anything you do to the main rate also makes banks' rates go up by quite a lot. So you might want to think about that particular, you know, about the financial sector and how that looks at the moment and what you want to do there. So, I think we should be a bit more careful than just um, than just shoving up rates. But if you're going to do rate rises at the moment, I think a couple of percentage points on corporation tax um, is probably one of the better places to look. And obviously, all sorts of um, options into the in, into the medium run. Um, but one of the things that uh, you know has been become very clear over the last year is that whatever the um, fiscal responses in terms of its quantity, or in terms of investment, or indeed in terms of things like uh, changes to corporation tax or income tax, we're likely to be dealing with uh, a world in which some people have done, you know, they've got through this last year reasonably well. Um, you know, people who have remained in work have probably, you know, a bunch of them have uh, built up quite a lot of savings. Um, people uh, over pension age on the whole haven't seen their incomes fall at all and have seen um, spending fall. So they're economically at least doing okay but we've got other groups particularly young people particularly the less well educated um who have suffered quite a lot so so carl when you're thinking about um the sorts of policies that we might see over the next year or two we shouldn't just be thinking should we about recovery in gdp and we shouldn't just be thinking about the overall deficit we really do need to start thinking about the distributional impacts of the sorts of uh, policies that the Chancellor is going to follow? Absolutely. We need to think about, you know, if the Chancellor starts to think now, well, actually, in four or five years' time, perhaps I want to be borrowing less money than what the OBR thinks will be the case if I don't take action. One reason for him to start to talk about the prospect of tax rises is not just so that the Treasury and those outside of government can advise them on what less damaging tax rises would be, as Helen was suggesting. It's also because we can start to have a conversation on who should bear the brunt of those tax rises. So we have a choice about the extent to which the balance should be on the working age population versus the pensioner population, um, the extent to which it should be progressive with respect to income. Um, You can have lots of different effects with different taxes. um, And we want to bear in mind not just how much money would a particular measure get you, not just how much damage would it do to the economy overall, but also who will be affected, who will be bearing the brunt of a rise um, in that tax. To give you two very simple examples, if you're looking to raise a very sizable sum, you could decide to push up the rates of income tax, or you could decide to push up the rates of national insurance. And if you go for national insurance, which is the kind of measure that both Labour and Conservative chancellors have gone for in the past when they need large sums, a byproduct of that is that you leave the pensioner population untouched largely because they have less of their income from earnings. Um, Now, that may be deliberate, that may be what we want, but given the kinds of inequalities, at least in terms of financial inequalities that have opened up in the last year, it may not be what we want. And it might point to the idea that if you were choosing between those two simple examples, you might argue there's more of a case for the rates of income tax being pushed up than the rates of national insurance. Just to come and building on that, you'd be building on Carl's thought there. I mean, some of the ways in which our tax system is poorly designed um, are exactly the ways, if we just increase rates, we're going to cause more problems. So Carl just mentioned income tax, and we all think of the main rate of income tax that's on wages and salaries. We have a lower rate of income tax on dividends, and more broadly, we have preferential rates for incomes um, 
from you know on from self-employment and from capital gains so if we just keep the current structure even if we put up all rates we're leaving those big preferential rates in place the people who get their income from capital um are going to be paying less for the same services effectively so rather than do that we should be thinking about reforming them so that for example we remove some of those preferential rates and put up higher taxes on you know, capital gains and, and dividends ideally fixing the tax base problems in order to stop in, stop the disincentives to investment but again just one example of many where rather than just keep the current distortions in place and sort of add to the problems we've already got we want to both you know reform the taxes and in in so doing help us to tackle the kind of inequalities you were mentioning Paul about you know across you know people who own capital don't own capital or live in different areas or, or different ages or all those types of things you know tax interacts with all of those in a way that we should we should be really careful about. And what, what about the spending side of things when it comes to uh, supporting groups who have done badly over the last year we've um, obviously heard a lot about the potential uh, to maintain the 20 pounds a week increase in universal credit but there's also going to be pressure isn't there for some kind of help for young people in the labor market uh, possibly help for uh, less well-off children at schools and so on do you expect that to be a central part of the of the budget i would have thought so i thought we'll see as part of the kind of response to the pandemic, um, we'll need to see a whole load of measures. We've talked a bit about measures for employers and employees. Um, but yes, on the public services side too, we may well hear about extra money for schools, possibly some other public services um, that have been struggling. And I think over the medium term, the Chancellor will also need to start thinking, and some of this will probably be an issue for the spending review that's coming later this year, to what extent will we need to spend more in some areas either to kind of make up for the lack of um, progress we've made over the last year, most obviously within the school system. And secondly, perhaps if there are lessons learned or things we just want to do differently going forwards because of the experience of the pandemic. If, for example, we might just decide we want more capacity in the NHS, we might just decide we want um, the working age benefit system to be more generous than it was pre-pandemic. There are big political choices to make there too. As we come to the end of this uh, very wide-ranging um, uh, discussion, I think it's worth reflecting on some of the some of where we've got. We're, we're going to a budget with a huge, um, huge deficit, but one which we're easily financing. Uh, the first priority uh, we think is for the Chancellor to ensure that support is maintained for long enough. Um, for people who are for firms and people through furlough schemes and business rates relief and so on, but all, but almost equally important that it's not for too long. So some phasing out over the next um, several uh, next several months. We're looking for um, uh, then an unknown really at this point level of more general support for the economy because that really depends on how quickly the economy itself bounces back. So we might get some indication of that in the budget but then we might expect the Chancellor to come back later in the year. When we're looking at um, public spending, uh, I think we're, um, uh, we're expecting some announcements on, for example, uh, the um, increase in universal credit, probably some more money for the health service and schools over this year. But into the medium run, again, we've got another fiscal event this year. We've got a spending review later in the year where I think we can expect more money to be allocated in future years for things like um, schools uh, and hospitals. And then we've got this really important distributional um, issue where we know that some groups have really been hit badly over the last year. And we really ought to be looking to the Chancellor to be doing things which are helping young people, to helping people um, who are have less wealth, helping people who are, on the whole, lower educated, who have really suffered badly in the labour market um, this year. In the medium run, then, we're going to be running a, a much bigger deficit than expected, and that's likely to mean some tax rises, but unlikely to mean tax rises in this budget, tax rises perhaps over the more uh, medium term. But a really important point that Helen's made is that if we're going to have, particularly if we're going to have substantial tax rises, it's really important that they come with tax reform uh, to make sure that those rises are both fair and not doing too much damage to the uh, economy. Before we finish, I just want to come to each of you with a final, um, uh, very unfair question. What are the two things you would like to see the Chancellor do um, in this budget? If you were Chancellor, what are the two things that would be top of your 
list? Okay, I think the first thing would be that um, if I was going to announce permanent takeaways, so tax rises, for example, I would have them to be no bigger than any giveaways, permanent giveaways that I had in the budget. So I'd be looking for, you know, one of the things we look for in the budget is the budget scorecard. I think that the bottom right hand corner, if you like, the amount of money you're taking out or putting in the economy as a result of today's statement in the final year of the forecast, probably to be around zero. Um, So not trying to fill that budget hole yet, but certainly not adding to it in a permanent sense. I think that's one thing I'll be looking for. Um, In terms of actual measures, I think the real priority, we talked a bit about some of the inequalities. It seems to me the real priority one has to be the inequalities that have opened up within our school system, because if they're not, if they're not tackled, if they're not dealt with, they're the ones that we'll be living with for a very, very long while. So I think that would be the one that I would be looking to really focus on. Um, that may not be entirely a budget announcement. It might be stuff that's going to come through the year for the spending review. But that would be the the area where actually delaying dealing with those inequalities could have adverse effects for some time to come. And Helen, for Carl, it's schools. What, what, what's your what's your number well, one? Well, I was going to sort of big and broad so that encompasses that. I think I'd. What I'd like to see is some sort of vision or framework for the future, some some sort of scoping out what, what the challenge is, so what, what we face. So I think there's two parts of that. One would be setting out the kind of whole set of challenges as the Chancellor sees them, even after the crisis is finished. That partly includes inequalities um, and, you know, the regaining the economic ground we've lost, but also the move to net zero, the levelling up agenda, that all those big policy challenges that sometimes, even once the crisis, as the COVID crisis is over, the other challenges sort of just kick in. So I'd like some scoping out of what are the broad set of things we're trying to achieve. And then as much as possible, some vision of not necessarily, not necessarily the nitty gritty policy details, but the how are we going to achieve them? So maybe some roadmaps for bits of tax that say, you know, how we tax different ways of work is broken Here's some kind of indication that we do want to fix it properly. And here's a process we're going to go through over the next three or four years um, so we get to a better place. I basically want some indication from the Chancellor. We're not going to just ignore it for four years and then in four years' time try and sort it out. I want some sense of we're going to move through a process that means in four years' time we've got the plans in place to really start making a you know more efficient, more effective, uh, fairer uh, you know, economy and tax system. Well, Helen wants some clarity on some quite big um, issues there. If you want a bit more clarity on um, net zero, then uh, you can listen to the podcast we recorded a few weeks ago with uh, Chris Stark, who's chief executive of the Climate Change Committee. And on levelling up, we uh, we talked to some of my colleagues a few months ago on that as well. But I think that's a, a timely reminder of the fact that we're not just dealing with uh, the COVID crisis at the moment, we're also, of course, dealing with Brexit, and that will be, you know, in, in the absence of COVID, that would have been absolutely top of the Chancellor's agenda. We've got the huge challenges of levelling up. We've got the huge challenges of net zero. That's going to keep the Treasury and indeed the IFS in business for some time to come. Um, but we'll find out a little bit more, I hope, uh, in a week or so's time uh, when the Chancellor actually. Uh, stands at the dispatch box and delivers his second budget. Well, thank you very much for listening to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. For all of our latest work, please visit www.ifs.org.uk. And actually, importantly, to further support our work, do consider becoming a supporter of the IFS uh, for as little as £5 a month. Uh, You can find a link with further information in the episode description. Uh, Thank you very much for listening and do stay well. Mm